I consider his greatest accomplishment just overcoming polio and moving forward um, and serving his country so um, successfully on such a national and world stage um, back then and even today having such a disease as polio being infirm the way he was being uh, uh, crippled the way he was then to go become a uh, leader of the free world in effect um, that's pretty amazing so just overcoming his physical infirm um, issues uh, more mentally uh, than anything else you just look at what he did with respect to the Great Depression, World War II, uh, himself. He was a guy who uh, just overcame uh, great obstacles personally and on behalf of our country. I will begin tonight because I like to start a lot of my presentations in the same way because I like this picture here. It's pretty gripping. Um, I think a lot of people look at that and say, who is, who is that little girl? And that is Regina Edwards, who at two and a half years old found herself in an iron lung in Houston's Jefferson Davis Hospital during the polio epidemic of 1952. Now, chilling images like that are faded history now. Uh, after the implementation of the Salk and Sabin vaccines, society heaved a sigh of relief and moved on, including to the best of their ability, the polio survivors themselves. Uh, so some sort of images like this, is, they're very foreign to medical students today. You know, it's not even studied much in medical schools at all. It's not uh, extensively covered in the curriculum. If medical students are familiar with the disease, it's in terms of the Global Eradication Initiative that's spearheaded by the CDC, the World Health Organization, and Rotary International. But how many of you remember this? Okay, <laughs> we do. We, we remember some, we either were there during those polio years, we remember at least taking the vaccines uh, certainly the Sabin vaccine. We knew we have family members uh, who, or friends, or it resonates with all of us on some, some level. But what impacts the medical community and regular citizens like us today are not only the memories we have and the survivors uh, that we know, but it's also the monumental legacies that came out of the polio years that I think we don't really realize. The legacies such as the extensive development of rehabilitation medicine. If you go to rehab today, this is pretty much where it began. The beginning of modern intensive care. All kinds of advances in the field of virology, all the vaccines that were developed. Uh, and also grassroots medical technology. And what we also do not know, and we'd like to hear here in Texas, is that Texas played a very important role in all of that. So I think first what we need to decide uh, to cover is what is polio? Polio is an incurable disease that is caused by a virus that is transmitted from person to person via unwashed hands or contaminated objects. It is highly contagious. It prefers warm climate, so often the most dangerous periods of polio epidemics were the summer months from May to October. And the disease also had a cruel affinity for children and young adults. Now, in most cases, the virus multiplies in the throat because it is a hand-to-mouth disease, so it multiplies in the throat, lodges in the digestive tract, and then is shed out through the stools. Now, the majority, there are various types of polio. The majority of uh, victims only have non-paralytic polio, which is when you have flu-like symptoms, which all polio cases usually start with, where you have your muscle aches, your fever, your upset tummy, uh, your runny nose over a period of two weeks, and it just does not go beyond that. And up to 95% of individuals who contracted the disease had non-paralytic polio. And that's going to be a problem later. But uh, that, that's what's going to make the disease so difficult 
to find the cause because you just have all these children or all these people and you cannot pinpoint it because they don't, they're not having these, um, these serious symptoms. But, so that's 95%. At other times, the virus breaks through that intestinal wall rather than shedding through the stools. It breaks through the intestinal wall, enters the bloodstream, and attacks the central nervous system specifically the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. And that is when paralysis occurs. That is uh, the type called spinal polio, which is the most common form of paralytic polio. It accounted for 80% of your para paralytic cases. That paralysis can be brief, it can be permanent. It can affect a hand, it can affect a limb, it can uh, affect you from waist down, it can affect you from neck down. There was no rhyme or reason if someone came in with, uh, had par a paralytic uh, or, or just had polio, you could not tell exactly which direction that was going to take, how it was going to manifest itself. Even today, there is no determining that, which makes it very frightening, of course. Now, the disease in its most dangerous form is bulbar polio, and that is when the virus affects the diaphragm and the muscles used for breathing. And then the worst type that you could have was, of course, the combination, bulbar, bulbar spinal, where you cannot breathe, your diaphragm is paralyzed, as is other parts of your body as well. Now, when outbreaks of polio began to plague American communities during the early part of the 20th century, the disease was nothing new. It had been around for centuries, as is evident by these uh, two illustrations here. You have this uh, ancient Egyptian stele. You see a uh, nobleman up there with a, with a withered leg. Uh, and then you also have Many centuries later, the romantic 19th century poet Sir Walter Scott, who uh, uh, contracted the virus at age two and uh, was paralyzed in his leg and he limped you know, for the rest of his life. What was new in the 20th century was polio in epidemic form. Before indoor plumbing, Individuals crack, contracted the disease at an early age. Remember, it shed through the stools, and so you often have babies crawling around on the floor. They get a, some, some virus you know, particles in their hands. They ingest it, but they're protected by the antibodies in their mother's breast milk. But the cleaner society became, especially American society, the more we adhered to that germ theory, we're cleaning up our homes, we're bringing those toilets indoors, the greater the delay of the exposure to the virus and the greater the susceptibility for a much more virulent or dangerous strain. So by 1913, polio had appeared in every state uh, and province in the United States and Canada. However, the vast majority of Americans really remained unaware of the disease until the summer of 1916. And that is when a polio epidemic gripped the East Coast with 2,000 reported cases and more than 6,000 deaths. So you see, see this arrow right here shooting up, and then it's low right through here, but it's that one extraordinary time, and then it starts to get uh, more prevalent into the 30s, and then, then you've got the 40s and 50s right here in the, at the end. So, you know, as my chart showed, the epidemic polio raged somewhere in Texas for the next 40 years. Between 1946 and 1955, polio was the fastest growing infectious disease of American youth. Now, what we, you might not know is that Texas was the hardest hit state of all in the nation. From 1942 to 1955, epidemics occurred almost yearly somewhere in Texas. It affected every region of the state from Amarillo to Edinburgh, from points east and west, metropolitan communities, tiny uh, you know, rural communities, uh, the community where my mother grew up, which was Bird, Texas. Have you all heard of that? That's south of Dallas, kind of south of Ennis, 
tiny community, but they had five children come down with that in 1953. For a tiny community, that signals an epidemic, uh, for sure. Um, so it, it was everywhere, but Houston and Harris County was the hardest hit of all. They had epidemics every year, every other year, with the exception and with the exception of Los Angeles County, California. No other county in the nation suffered epidemics with such frightening regularity. And of course, the worst year was 1952. So you might ask, well, why? Why is that? Why, why is Texas and certainly South Texas suffering like that? Well, there's no definite reason, but experts certainly point to several, um, several good ones. The polio virus thrives in warm climate. South Texas definitely has it. You don't have those harsh winters, so it doesn't cool off. It doesn't kill it you know, as often, so it thrives. Number two had a lot to do with the World War, World War II. That here we were with all of these military bases down here. So you had your airmen, you had your military staff, you had your individuals coming to work in wartime industries. And they're coming from all over the United States in areas where you did not have polio very much. And then they're coming to an area where it is thriving. So they were not susceptible to it at a younger age. And so a lot of individuals contracted it that way. Then after the war, they also wanted to come back, work in the oil industry and you know, these other industries that post-war Texas offered. And so then they brought their wives, their families. So you just had this very dense population down here. Everyone's living close together. This is a disease that's highly contagious. And it just, it was just thrived here. Polio crept into Texas communities in early May. Here and there, children would complain of weariness, backache, stiff neck, and then caseloads would begin to uh, overwhelm local hospitals. And if you were a, pr a parent at that time, you were absolutely terrified. Everyone knew polio was caused by a virus. That had been proved in 1908. But no one knew how it was transmitted and certainly how to prevent it from invading your community or your neighborhood. So wherever polio struck, medical and lay communities just did whatever they knew to do. And whatever you know to do is whatever worked in, in epidemics of other diseases uh, that, that might have happened in, in your community. So let's just say, you know, if you are familiar with the influenza epidemic, then of course quarantine and crowd control is going to be something you're going to try. So um, all a lot of communities, they, they close their schools, their theaters, their public venues. A lot of uh, people, children who were growing up during those years remember being kept indoors, your compulsory naps, your mother monitoring, monitoring what you ate. I really don't remember a whole lot. I was three and a half years old. And uh, really the, the main thing I remember is my mother rocking me at night when I would be uh, sick and uh, you know, trying to quiet me down because evidently I was in a lot of pain, high fever or whatever. I don't really remember contracting it. We didn't know what we got it from, um, but I had a brother that was never affected in any way. We slept in the same bed. And uh, so I don't really remember, remember from her rocking me going to uh, the doctor and them sending me to Chester Clinic out on Lancaster Road there in Oak Cliff, because we lived in Oak Cliff, and uh, getting a spinal tap, which I really wasn't for. I mean, that was, I remember that as being a very painful thing for a three and a half year old kid. And then uh, really my next memories of it are really being in Parkland, being admitted to Parkland Hospital uh, while I was contagious and being in a room that was very small, about maybe six by 10 or something like that. And then of course in a childhood bed that had the high rails on it and everything and no visitors, you were in isolation, you were quarantined. And, um, you know, I remember nurses coming in and checking on you and stuff like that. But uh, I do remember there was a tree outside my room that my dad climbed up to, to look at me. <laughs> and I remember, I remember that. Acting on the theory that, okay, mosquitoes bring malaria, they bring yellow fever, maybe they bring polio. 
So if that's the case, many public health authorities ordered DDT spread liberally throughout their respective regions, either through the trucks or by airplane. So if you are um, a baby boomer, as we called ourselves during those times, and you remember yourself either running uh, behind those trucks spraying in your face or um, riding your bike behind it or maybe even climbing onto the truck, okay, uh, all, all of that was, a de was you know, as a way to prevent polio. Now, those kind of measures are, are going on everywhere, and, but you know, certainly there were some that were rather extraordinary. And one of them, uh, a, a couple of them came from uh, San Angelo in 1949. Uh, they had a horrendous epidemic that particular year. And so some of the responses uh, were on the lines of people living in San Angelo would not talk on the telephone for fear, what if polio's coming through the phone lines? Or they certainly, you know, are not putting air in their tires. You're not going to drive out with it, right? You're, if you drive through town during those years, you, uh, during that summer, you certainly drove through with the car windows rolled up. You moved right on through. Uh, keep in mind that was long before air conditioning in cars. So all of those sort of things, people were that frightened. And so it's very illustrative of what fear can do, right? Uh, but the public responses and kind of reactions uh, are very similar to polio epidemics elsewhere. I knew of a woman who said, you know, she worked in a hospital down in Galveston, and women lobbied, you know, phys female physicians and nurses lobbied during uh, the polio epidemics down there of 43 and 45 that maybe women should wear pants rather than dresses. Y'all just use that, use your imagination on that one but as to maybe that's a way to prevent it. So, uh, but the fear of contracting the disease was only part of this experience. The Texas experience, as I conveyed earlier, stood apart by laying all of these medical legacies. They set the foundation for these significant medical legacies. So for one, while there was and still is not a cure for polio, physicians could treat the physical effects of the disease in a variety of ways, and orthopedics uh, was a new specialty that gained traction right after World War I. So in the early 1920s, orthopedic surgeon William Beale Carroll did much to hasten the development of rehabilitation medicine in Texas. He's the director of the Texas Scottish Rite Hospital for Crippled Children in Dallas, and throughout the polio years, that hospital, 90% of the patients they treated were uh, polio patients. And I love that picture. I just, I just think that is, that is great. Uh, some people call that an hour gang picture, but I think it's really cute. But also, uh, Scottish Rite uh, uh, specialized in surgeries. And that uh, child is getting a back brace, I mean, just a, a body cast uh, put on. But it's uh, oftentimes the surgeries, if you had spinal surgery, uh, you would get a body cast. Uh, also, you had a lot of surgeries that just that uh, were followed by traditional braces and splints that held those polio-affected uh, joints and muscles in a neutral position and helping to improve function. But what also came out of it that uh, Texas Scottish Rite uh, implemented uh, earlier than a lot of other hospitals was a hot pack treatment. And what that did was to try to wait a little bit before you put those, uh, you know, you put those braces on, to try to help those uh, healthy muscles gain a little bit more strength and ability. And so that maybe you would not have to wear your brace at all, or at least you would not have to wear it as long. That was pretty miserable for a three and a half year old kid. Uh, you know, I could see him coming with it in the ward and you knew what was happening. It was very hot. I mean, it was, uh, it was two uh, African-American women that came in. And if I'm recalling right, their name was Jesse and Faye. And uh, they would bring in these, it was like a tub as best I can remember. And it was very hot wool rags and they would just put them all over my legs and my arms and uh, you know let it set for a while and then they'd 
do it again. I don't remember how long the treatments were for, but uh, they did that. Now, I know we're all very familiar with uh, President Franklin Roosevelt. You know, he, he, uh, his legacy is very prevalent throughout this story. But Roosevelt contracted uh, polio in August of 1921 while vacationing at Campo Bello, his, fam his family retreat um, off the coast of Canada. And it left him paralyzed uh, from waist down for the remainder of his life. Roosevelt believed he had become ill after a rigorous swim in the Bay of Fundy. More likely, he contracted polio when paying a visit to a Boy Scout jamboree a few days earlier. The incubation period for polio is seven to 21 days. He had gone swimming and then that night he began to feel sick, but that is how he attributed it. He was tired, you know, he went swimming, he felt fatigue, this is how it went. This is how he, he uh, saw, the, saw the trajectory there. And in that day, they did not understand how to treat. This is 1921, a lot of the rehabilitative techniques had not been developed yet. And so there was definitely the idea that they did too much massaging, too much moving him around so that it exacerbated his paralysis. But try as he might, you know, he never regained, uh, regained use of his legs. And you, know, you definitely have story, he, he founded the Gonzales, I mean, the, the uh, Georgia Warm Springs Hospital because hydrotherapy, when he's in a warm pool, especially these sulfuric warm spring pools, he, he felt so much more vigorous. He could stand, he could do exercises, he, he could walk you know, in the pool. But, as, but he never did regain. And so that is what is so interesting, is here you had this public figure who never did walk, but what he was able to do is he had a physical therapist who worked with him and they worked a long time on this to give the impression of walking. But what he was able to do is he had one of his sons, his sons had to exercise, get their arms as tough as, you know, strong as a parallel bar, and he would lean on his cane, then lean on his son, lean on, and it took, a, he's putting all of his weight pretty much on his son and then back and forth. But if they went slowly and talked to people and, you know, as they went, it looked like he was truly walking with just someone escorting him. Polio brought out a lot of empathy and compassion in him. And then you also think of Roosevelt was one of these young men that were born with a silver spoon in their mouth, but he was an only child. He was very lonely a lot of the time. And so I think he already understood the issues that children have. And then you put this illness on, you know, this uh, disability on top of it, I am sure. And, and knowing these children did not have all of the, where, all the resources that he had. You know, they are going to have to go out into life without people putting the cameras down. They are going to have to forge it on their own. And he knew that. And I think that brought it out as well. In 1937, uh, the Gonzales, right at, just outside of Gonzales, Texas, uh, they founded the Gonzales Warm Springs Rehabilitation Hospital. And it was, had this wonderful warm spring, had this hydrotherapeutic hydrothera um, treatments there, and Gonzales Warm Springs and Georgia Warm Springs uh, were the only two rehabilitation hospitals devoted solely to polio patients in the United States during the polio years. If you've ever been to Palomero State Park, that was also the beauty of, of patients who got to go to uh, Gonzales Warm Springs is they got to, you know, they had the nice pools, but then you had this lovely park that they got to go over to right next door. But of great importance to patients suffering from bulbar and bulbar spinal polio was the development of the artificial respirator or iron lung. Bulbar polio is when the virus affects the diaphragm and other muscles used for breathing. And when that is paralyzed, then thus uh, you either have to be kept alive through there was like a manual airbag that you can kind of squeeze, you know, and, and kind of massage and ma manually, and that can occur for maybe 48 hours and then that's all 
all anyone could truly do. So the iron lung was developed in response to this growing numbers of individuals who were coming down with bulbar polio where their diaphragm was being uh, paralyzed and the iron lung is what is helping them breathe. So the respirator had these bellows on one end and then this control knob and the bellows when they expanded the air pressure inside the tank would lower it caused the chest the, the uh, polio patient's chest to expand air to go into their lungs and then when the bellows contracted the pressure would within the tank would uh, would heighten and then force the patient to expel so the development of the iron lung was without question a godsend to both um, patients and physicians. But there's a problem with this, and that is that iron lung patients require this aggressive, around-the-clock supervision that most Texas hospitals during that day did not have the funding, they did not have the equipment, they didn't have the staff to handle this. And so Think about this, you know, most hospitals, if they had any iron lungs at all, it would be probably a maximum of three. If you have a polio epidemic in, uh, in, in a city next to you or a town next to you, and you have all of these, you know, these polio uh, patients coming through the doors, unable to breathe, and you have very few machines, if any, that is going to put, that put a lot of lives in jeopardy. A lot of people uh, expired due to that. So to address that issue, in 1950, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, March of Dimes, as we know it, began to establish respiratory centers throughout the country. So they selected areas where epidemics were prevalent, and they installed numerous iron lungs in one room. And they put them all there in a row or in rows, the patient side by side, and a nurse for every two. And so with that round-the-clock care, the mortality rate plummeted from seven, about 70% in those iron lungs to about 10% with that round-the-clock care. And because of that, these centers became the forerunner of, the, of what we know of as modern intensive care. Houston, with its record for epidemics, became home to the first center of this kind. It opened in June of 1950, the Southwestern Poliomyelitis Respiratory Center. Some of you might know of it as TIER today. Now, this is just a picture I wanted to show you. It certainly gives you an idea of how uh, of the variety of ages of, of these um, polio patients. This was the youngest uh, little, little patient that came into uh, uh, Southwestern. That is uh, Frederick Brooks of Moulton, Texas. He was six weeks old uh, when he was in an iron lung. I do believe he got out of it though. Yeah, well, when I was the patient at Scottish Rite on uh, Sunday afternoons, it was very popular because that was visitation day. You only got to see your parents or anybody uh, once a week, and that was from 2 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, of course, you'd just wait till 2 o'clock, and when you saw those doors open, you uh, it was sheer jubilation when your parents or whoever was visiting you would come through those doors. And uh, <clears throat> then, of course, you got to visit for the two hours, and um, it was quite a good time. You know, that was a, took your mind off of everything else that happened, the isolation through the rest of the week, or isolation from your relatives. And uh, during that time, it was fun because there was a lot of different visitors that would come in. There was a gentleman that came in every Sunday, brought every patient Wrigley's gum. He'd bring a brown box and he'd let you, I think, choose three packages of gum. And he was there faithfully every Sunday. People would come in and bring you everybody balloons. And uh, so there was always people bringing candy, balloons, gum, trinkets, if you will. And uh, that was a great time until four o'clock rolled around. <laughs> then that got pretty... Uh, pretty sad time you know your parents were leaving there was a lot of bawling and squalling going on from the kids and and the parents too it was just uh you know for two hours at a time that's not very long in a week's time for a kid to see their parents i think when something's wrong with you like that 
and you're the one in a crowd of 10 kids that's got something wrong with you, that you're going to try a lot harder than that other kid to do it, to show them you can do it and be equal to them. Yeah, which fortunately I was. I, the neighborhood I grew up in, there was about 10 or 12 other kids on the same block. I think there were about three boys and the rest of them were girls. I don't ever remember any of them really treating me a whole lot differently because I played with them and like any normal kid, now a few of them when they get mad at me, they're pretty good at name calling and stuff. But uh, as far as getting along with them and, and being determined to do what they did, I learned to ride a bicycle with a brace on. I might have fell off of it about 50 times before I ever did it, but I got it and I did it. Now, at the center of any historical event are, of course, the individuals that lived it. And that was really the favorite part of my research, was traveling throughout Texas to gather experiences from this diverse group of individuals who provided various aspects of this polio story. The patients themselves, Within a, few, within a few short hours, polio is going to turn their lives upside down. Uh, and just learning how they confronted the harrowing uh, aspects of the disease, especially coming to terms with the polio altered body. The parents who, and family members whose lives are forever altered as well. And the masks of cheerfulness that many of those parents wore in the midst of very heart-wrenching circumstances. One of them is down there at the bottom. You see uh, little Betty McWilliams and her father, Tom, at the Edinburgh Hospital. Now there he is visiting her. She is in an iron lung, and he definitely uh, is smiling broadly. So what Betty does not know at that time is, of course, polio could uh, strike more than one family member. It often did. So what she does not know at that point when that photograph is taken is that her mother has just died in, in uh, the room next to her of polio. In the manner of many parents today, they exhibited the grit and the determination to ensure their children had the best care possible. And of course, Sherry Jo Kaler uh, worked at the League City, uh, City Hall for years. Uh, I, I knew her well. But there are also, so there are a lot of heart, you know, just uh, very uh, admirable stories, but they certainly were not all like that. Uh, I also heard a lot of stories of those who, you know, did not step up to the plate, stories of spousal abuse, stories of parental um, abandonment. I also heard stories uh, record of uh, uh, experiences of physicians and caregivers who treated, soothed, and consoled in the midst of a hospital atmosphere that was often compared to a war zone. And all this while having their own fears of contracting the disease themselves, or even more horrific, taking it home to, to their own loved ones. But they also, in the midst of that tension and that terror that they themselves had, they had a lot of joy and satisfaction in helping many of these patients overcome severe adversity. Polio, which is another one of the legacies, was the first grassroots philanthropic campaign to end a, dis a disease. Because this disease resonated with everyone and with the March of Dimes campaigns, everyone could participate. Anyone could give a dime, and that was, that was the slogan and that was the push. And so I interviewed uh, members of the Army of Volunteers, the mothers who would go on the Mother's March in, in January, um, uh, raising money from door to door. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, and uh, of course wearing a brace and everything, that when it first came into vogue, I guess you could say. But I, I remember taking a little can, going out in the neighborhood. A bunch of us kids would all go fan out and go collect the dimes. <laughs> And uh, especially with Jerry Lewis, telephone came along, and, and uh, but yeah, I collect just like the other kids did. It was it was important, and that's what we did. 
your radio announcers, your March of Dimes poster children who participated in a striking display of community cooperation to end this disease through the raising of funds for uh, polio treatment, patient care, and research. And of course, due to the frightening prevalence of polio epidemics in Texas, that uh, it is not surprising that Texans gave generously and supported a lot, a numerous of these March of Dimes initiatives. And of course, they often had a Texas twist to them. Uh, the top one is um, National March of Dimes poster child, Linda, Br uh, Linda Brown, with then a Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn. And then, of course, we have the hapless calf, Mr. Polio, waiting to be auctioned off as part, as, a, as part of a March of Dimes fundraising initiative. Yeah, my years at Scottish Rite were great. I mean, I didn't like going there, of course, being having surgeries or just being confined in a hospital. But uh, even as a kid, it was kind of weird. I thought it was a beautiful place. <laughs> had that big circular drive in front and columns on the front porch and these big long uh, wings going out to the side that were the wards. And, uh, but it was, it was a great place. You know, you had, uh, they always treated you well. And, uh, you know, you had things to do. They would come around with a ward and you might paint a little object or something or read books. They brought the library to you. They, uh, the doctors were great, all the orderlies and nurses. I have a, a picture of one nurse that I, remember it uh, a real sweet lady she was i guess worked a late shift and uh, every night it was a uh, 23rd song when she turned off the lights 23rd song <laughs> but every, you know everybody was good I, I never remember maybe one or two people that would even get halfway cross with you for anything even the lady back then that would come around testing blood in which i remember they had to they prick your finger and then suck on a little hose and get the blood out. That was weird, but uh, no matter what you called her or thought of her, she would, she'd get that blood and she was nice. And, and uh, it, was, it was a good experience considering what you were going through. But I also had the pleasure of gleaning firsthand experiences from these public health professionals who had participated in that successful research effort to cultivate a safe and effective vaccine. During the 1940s and early 50s, there was a research group that was headed by John Enders at Boston uh, Children's Hospital. And they had successfully cultivated the polio virus in human tissue. And so that significant breakthrough not, is going to earn uh, Enders and his crew the Nobel Prize, but it's also even more part, is going to allow for the development of a polio vaccine. So the first one was developed by Jonas Salk, which we saw the newsreel. He was a young virology at the, a virologist at the University of Pittsburgh. And the Salk vaccine, what it does is its primary goal was to combat paralytic polio. How do we stop that? That is what people are the most afraid of. So the Salk vaccine was an inactivated or killed polio virus that you injected in your arm, goes straight into the bloodstream. And so then uh, the, the, the vaccine goes straight into the bloodstream and then goes to attack, you know, starts to protect the central nervous system where polio, paralytic polio would, would attack. So to ensure the vaccine's safety and effectiveness, it had to be tested on a large scale. And that was called Operation Polio which was a 1954 field trials involving almost 625,000 American school children at a ver that very susceptible age to get polio from first grade through third grade. And they were known as your polio pioneers. And it, by, uh, you know, incorporate by, you know, recruiting all of them and, and, and doing this trial, it was one of the largest clinical trials ever undertaken. And Texas was a popular testing ground. Uh, ten counties were involved. Dallas was. Tarrant County was. Um, Harris County, Nueces, Taylor, a lot of them that you're probably familiar with. So the efficacy of the Salk vaccine was declared uh, to the world a year later in 1955, and it had 75% reliability. We say 75%, but that's big 
when before you had nothing. So it was, it was incredibly successful. By 1957, the annual number of paralytic polio cases in the United States had dropped 90%. So here, paralytic polio has dropped. But you had Albert Sabin, who is want, wanting to target both. He says, OK, we've, we've attacked uh, paralytic, but can, can we also attack non-paralytic? And that is important because non-paralytic is, as I said before, a lot of people have it. They don't know they have it. They are giving it. You, you cannot stop the disease until everyone is vaccinated. It's also those who yeah, who, who don't know, who've always had a mild case. So his idea was this mass inoculation to take place and use a live vaccine, uh, with a vaccine with a live virus that you take orally. And it goes that exact route of, you know, going into the digestive tract and that vaccine is then shed out. And eventually what that creates is a herd immunity, eventually. So those of you who remember the Sabin vaccine, going and getting the sugar cube or the drop, that is why, that is, that, that is what that did. And after the Sabin vaccine, then you know, the, uh, the fear of polio, polio cases just plummeted almost to absolutely nothing. So after the mass implementation of the Salk and Sabin vaccines, polio ceased to be a vital concern. And as a result, March of, Time, March of Dimes funding coffers uh, that supplied medical and financial assistance to polio survivors began to dry up, and American society moved on. And they expected polio survivors to do the same thing. But the public fear, the hospital experience, and the search for a vaccine are pieces of a story that for polio survivors has lasted a lifetime, long after the regular discourse involving the disease has faded. A physical handicap, wrote polio survivor Irving Zola, constitutes a loss of time, a loss of capacity, of function, of appearance. It has to be acknowledged. And as our limps, our braces, our drugs, our weaknesses are a constant reminder to us all the time. So it is also a story of how in spite of disability, polio survivors buoyed by months or years of physical rehabilitation strove to fit into the American mainstream and leave the disease as far behind as they individually could. It depended on the level of disability, how well they could do that. But they all tried to at the level that they possibly could. Now, this is decades before the passage and implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so successful integration into the American mainstream is going to be a daunting task. It's before you had transportation facilities uh, that had lifts. It is before public building ramps. It's before disabled parking, uh, elevators in many structures. So you can imagine if you are a child or a young person who is coming home from the hospital and has gone through rehabilitation and are, you know, you are asking questions. How do I get to school? How do I go get up the stairs once I'm there? A lot of the old elementary high schools, those are stairs. Uh, how do I walk across campus? How do I get a job in a culture at the time that it was, you know, there was no compunction. It was, it was very accepted to say, we do not hire the disabled, period. So it's going to require a lot of determination. It's going to require a lot of help. Uh, from friends, uh, from you know, uh, ha having a lot of resources, and it, you know, you definitely had some pioneer pioneering physicians who are in the game as well. Will William Spencer, who was a professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine and who was director of the Southwestern Poliomyelitis Respiratory Center, was a strong proponent of the independent living movement long before most were. In 1954, he founded the Wolf Home, 
which was a premier occupational and vocational uh, facility where you know, severely indi uh, disabled individuals could live there, that they could gain the tools they needed uh, uh, to live economically productive and independent lives. And so to demonstrate the feasibility of his stance, Spencer employed several of his former patients on a full-time basis because he wanted to prove to the medical, a very skeptical medical community, as well as the public in general, that you can hire a severely individ, uh, disabled individual, they will do a 40-hour work week, and they will do it well. So in time, though, a lot of your polio survivors entered the mainstream, and then they also began to agitate for systemic change. They became leaders of the disability movement that came out of the 1960s. They became involved in the formation of community-based groups to identify barriers to public accessibility and employment equality. And so they were very much behind uh, the ADA when it was passed in 1991. But beginning in the late 1980s, a cruel twist began to emerge for many polio survivors. Their strength and stamina that they had been regained began to diminish. They found it more difficult to work and carry out normal day-to-day -day activities of living. The condition was eventually given a name. It was sloughed off for a long time, but it was given a name, post-polio syndrome known as PPS, which is a progressive neurological disorder that is considered the sequel to having polio. Overcoming polio and leading as normal a life as possible required immense effort and to train undamaged muscles and nerves, you know, your healthy muscles and nerves, to carry the load of those that had been damaged. And so now after a lifetime of that adaptation, the healthy muscles are wearing out. So for approximately 65% of polio survivors, the debilitating symptoms of PPS have forced them to return to the braces, the wheelchairs, and the breathing machines that they had worked so hard to escape. Often they uh, eventually become bedridden and expire of pneumonia-related illnesses. But there are two things that came out of PPS as well. One of them, of course, forced uh, polio survivors to slow down. But the other one was that when they were trying to get into, you know, to break into the mainstream, they often did not congregate together. If you were a polio uh, uh, survivor and there were other ones at your school, y'all did not mix very much. You know, you, in order to get into the mainstream, you wanted to be as normal as possible and, and fit in. But as time goes on, uh, they certainly see that in order to succeed in, the, in their later years, that they need each other's support. And so that is when they began to acknowledge each other. And they had these polio support groups, such, such as the, uh, this is the Houston, some members of the Houston chapter of the Polio Survivors Association. And the useful knowledge and associations they provided then gave this lifeline as they're aging. And, uh, and they're suffering from some of these uh, latent you know, polio um, symptoms. So in conclusion, in addition to getting the story of polio down while survivors still remain to tell it, it's important for us to underscore that polio is not a disease of the past. It's very much alive and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. It is alive through the polio survivors themselves, many of who wrestle uh, now with post-polio. It is alive through the family members and others who became so intimately entwined with those that had polio. It is alive through the legacies, the rehabilitation medicine, the intensive care, the philanthropy, the vaccines. And also, the disease continues in other parts of the world. It has been eradicated from the Western Hemisphere since the 1979, but uh, there have been outbreaks in other parts of the world. But 
Through the uh, in efforts of WHO and the CDC and Rotary International, polio eradication campaigns have been incredibly successful, reducing polio cases throughout the world by 99.9%. Uh, since they began this endeavor in the early 1970s. In 1988, there were 125 polio uh, endemic countries. Now there are only three, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, that are ongoing, still ongoing uh, conflicts within those countries is making uh, vaccination still uh, a bit difficult. So we've come very far. And yet the disease is still very close. And in order to underscore how close it is uh, for us here in Dallas, uh, there is a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Alexander who contracted polio in, I believe, in 1953, and he is one of the last remaining uh, individuals in the United States that is still has lived his entire life in an iron lung. Uh, his story is a phenomenal one, and we have a news clip, uh, a short little video clip. Polio is watched very carefully because it's a, it's a um, hideous disease. It's horrible because it's so. Um, Contagious and it's and it's um, the extent of damage to a human being is totally unpredictable. The mind was extensive. One of the worst cases ever recorded, and I'm still here. Um, but I've watched thousands of kids in my ward. In my time, that park would die of it that had considerably less problem. You never know. So, the machine, um, I can tell you that it is another way of life. It's a different kind of life. And that you're totally restricted. Many people would go crazy in it. And I watched them do it in the hospital. But you adapt and you learn to do what you need to do to accomplish your goals and your dreams with the help of the iron lung. The iron lung is home to me now. It's, um, it's my friend and it's my enemy. Um, in the end, he keeps me alive. Was there any information whether the outhouses versus the indoor plumbing affected the polio rates? Um, Yes, well, in, in terms of that earlier, you know, that, that you could contract it at an earlier age and sometimes get a milder case due to if, if you lived in a more dirty existence. That, that is the most interesting thing and so paradoxical about polio is it is a clean disease. The cleaner you became, the more susceptible you were. It doesn't make sense in our germ you know, in, in our germ uh, uh, related thinking, but that, that was the case. Now, I uh, remember lining up at, s at the school, and there were literally hundreds of people in line. Mm -hmm. it, I just remember it seemed like all afternoon I was just standing in line. Do we ever have to get boosters for this, or is that, was that? Uh, you, you do not have to have boosters now for this at all. Um, my children uh, had had I think they had their polio shot when they were you know when they were children and I mean their polio booster and I think the last one they had they were probably five years old 
something like that. You had it as a baby, and then, but the, I, I don't believe they have them beyond that. Okay. No. no, not in the United States where it's eradicated, for sure. In today's society, what immunizations are parents still able to opt out of mm. in, in the public health arena? That is a good question, you and I cannot necessarily answer that. I think uh, some of them are opting out, I mean, or saying no to several immunizations. That is what is making uh, the medical community pretty nervous is because the fewer children immunized for some of these things, then, then they can come back. You, would. It's, you, you need an immunized population in order to ensure that these diseases don't come back, especially with uh, air travel and the way you know, people travel and, and the way uh, you know, everything's just a plane ride away now that it's, uh, it, it, it can be very uh, dicey at times. And that's why you know, some, some of these diseases are coming back is because of that. Thank you. But not polio yet here. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the, uh, the gentleman, the scientist, that first isolated the virus. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite catch his name. Was it Enders? Enders. John Enders. 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 Uh -huh. And uh, do you have any idea how long it took him to be successful in his endeavor? That's another excellent question, and I cannot say for sure. I believe he was working on that, though, for about 10 years. 10 years. Mm -hmm. Before, before they, it, a lot, polio research began to really get its legs during World War II, when a lot of these physicians overseas were seeing things, including Sabin, you know, who developed his vaccine 20 years later, but he was seeing certain pieces to the puzzle uh, when he was overseas during World War II. Did that gentleman by any chance uh, write a book uh, describing his research efforts? John Enders? I believe he did. I'd like to read that. Yes. That should be interesting. It Thank you. Most certainly. Another very good book to read is um, about the vaccine effort is David Oshinsky's um, Polio, an American Story. And he, that, that was written about 10 years ago. He won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for it. It is an excellent, fascinating book, and it has a lot about John Enders in that. Uh, my granny, she was 18 and 20 when she had my dad and my aunt mm -hmm. in the 40s, and she got them signed up for that initial thing. She talked about that every, for years. Really? She just died this year, but in the last year she talked about it and how she was always so scared, so as soon as they had that, she signed them up right away, and they were in the first group. Interesting. And, and then my and mom had a friend who, years later, he was in the 90s, she knew him, but both he and his two brothers were in the hospital with polio when his father left the mother. And then years later, tried to get back with him, but mm -hmm. they didn't want anything to do with him because he left him there. And the right. younger brother was in a wheelchair early on, and then this guy died several years ago because of complications from polio later. Really? Mm -hmm. And was all that here in, in the Dallas area? Well, my, I don't know where my granny and was. I think they were in either Wyoming or Oklahoma when they got my dad and okay. my aunt vaccinated. But then um, the other guy was in Oklahoma. That's where I'm from, Oklahoma. Okay. Thank you. It's sad we've never heard of Dr. Enders, but everybody knows of Dr. Salk. <laughs> As one who was born in 1952, I feel very fortunate to have escaped that scourge. I did have a second cousin who was a combination of wheelchair and braces on her legs. Right. Um, okay. Really, yeah. you know, as long as I knew her. Mm -hmm. But I, I did have a question um, regarding transmission. Um, you, you mentioned fecal transmission. Mm -hmm. Was there any kind of fomitic transmission or, or, or uh, bodily fluids, anything like that? No. Uh, they, so if they you got sneezed on or anything like that, that shouldn't be no, a problem. A sneeze, cough, they, they certainly feared that, but no, uh, no nothing, on, nothing on that line. And, and then um, on the, you talk about all the people that, you know, had like the fever, flu-like symptoms, mm -hmm. everything like that. W at that point, were they able to, was there a diagnostic evaluation where they could actually say, okay, 
you have polio, but you know, oh, were, but were they able to distinguish it from flu or something else mm -hmm. to generate those numbers that you have quoted? Yes. Um, one, one, one way that they generated it was through a spinal tap uh, where they pulled the spinal fluid out so you could have a kind of mildish case and they could still find it you know, in, your, in your spinal fluid. Uh, if you had a backache or whatever, they, they would do that. Now, this is, this is the key though, and this is, uh, is that a lot of people... Go back to the mic. Whoops, sorry. Uh, I walk around and leave my, leave my mic, I'm sorry. A lot of people um, had polio and never, never, and never knew they did. And so that is the thing also with post-polio is some people, which is rather frightening, but some people are coming down with some of these post-polio symptoms, you know, maybe the, the fatigue, the weakness, that sort of thing, and they had polio, but they never knew they did. So that, that's something to kind of keep in, keep in mind as well. And that was why it was so hard to find a, to, to create a, the, the only way to cure polio was to, for a vaccine because it was so mild and you cannot track it any other way uh, to be able to say for sure how it was transmitted. Have you kept up with the Paul Anderson story or anything? There was just an article about him in the paper just a few months ago. And um, the, the challenge he always had with or is having with the iron lung was being able to find parts for it. And when the mm -hmm. bellows would go out right. or anything, right. there were some people that were helping him and mm -hmm. some guy was able to fabricate mm -hmm. some things, but the, also the challenge was his caregiver was not in good health. And okay. you even saw a picture of her there with mm -hmm. you know, something with, with her foot. And so there was a concern whether she was even gonna be available anymore. So I was just wondering, and fantastically, he had a long distinguished career as, a, as an attorney. Right. He would argue courses uh, uh, cases in court in an iron lung. The guy was amazing. It, it, yeah, isn't that fan fascinating? In terms of the iron lung aspect of your question, I did know that is, that is a problem because these companies, I think the last one was based in Colorado, stopped making parts for iron lungs about eight, eight to ten years ago now. And so Individuals who are in an iron lung have to have them jerry-rigged, is what I would call it. You know, finding uh, this individual that I knew in Temple. Uh, you know, he he knew of a, his family knew of a, a car mechanic who put a new rubber. You know, managed to craft a new rubber, uh, uh, whatever you call that, that goes around around your neck. You know how. Those who have a better technical term than I. Harness. Uh, harness, there you go. Uh, <laughs> collar, yes. Um, but also some other aspects uh, of the iron, you know, other parts is, is kind of how, how they're having to hold those together. The caregiver, I, I did not know that, uh, but I know that um, I'm sure those that are schooled in Polio uh, survivors are very, very rare now. And uh, Michael LaFan, the individual that I talked about who was in the iron lung his entire life in, um, in uh, Temple, or you know, the last 60 years of his life, his he had one caregiver who came in, but his primary caregiver was his father. And his last, when, I, when Michael passed, his father was in his 90s. 94, and still lifting Michael out of the iron lung every day, getting him into his uh, kind of wheelchair with the bubble respirator, feeding him the whole bit. And when Michael expired, you know, I thought, oh, you know, uh, uh, James would go pretty soon after, and, and he did. Yeah. But uh, he lived, he was going to stay alive and healthy as long as Michael was there. One last question, anybody? Okay. Hi, yeah, um, I have a question. So you mm -hmm. were talking about how um, usually polio came up in people that were like trying to be like more like clean, I guess. And um, so was there like a variance in the amount of people that were getting polio um, depending on their socioeconomic like status? And if like, 
just kind of basing off like cleanliness and all that stuff, you would think that people were with um, like higher wages and stuff mm -hmm. would be the people that would be cleanlier. And I know mm -hmm. like now we have issues with insurance and people being mm -hmm. able to pay. Mm -hmm. Like was that an issue back then as well? Okay, two, two very good questions. Um, to the, the first one, no. Polio affected everybody, regardless of ethnicity, uh, race, socioeconomic class, it was across the board. Now, there might have been more cases reported, you know, more uh, individuals, uh, white individuals could gain access to hospitals than uh, African Americans. But it did, and so thus the re hospital records may tell you something different, but across the board it was affecting all communities. And of course then that is why it was, it was a disease that everyone got on board to support. And I had the March of Dimes, you know, you saw, you, I had uh, African American March of Dimes poster children, you have, had white, you had Hispanic, I mean they were all, they were all, all, all there. And now I, ha I have to say, I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> what was it again? I, I, insurance, yes, okay. They didn't, some had, they had there was polio insurance uh, was one aspect in which um, some of these insurance companies sold polio insurance. But for the most part, people did not have insurance. Uh, like they have today, that is why, again, the March of Dimes was so, or, or some of these other entities too, like the Lions Club and these other organizations were so important in terms of uh, raising money, raising these huge coffers, because if you, you know, if you are in an iron lung, or even if you're not, even if you're just a, you know, a, a, a polio survivor who has quite a few you know, disabilities, that is going to cost, it would cost, back in the 1950s, it was about 75,000 to 100,000 a year. We may, we may not blink at that, but keep in mind the average house so was $10,000. So that tells you just how expensive it was. And so that is where these organizations, that's where a lot of people were able uh, to have their treatment and have long-term care was through these organizations. Here in Dallas, the Scottish Rite, as she mentioned, was organized just for this purpose. But once polio subsided, then they became more interested in helping children, uh, spinal bifida and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was, all, it was free for children, not adults, mm -hmm. who had polio.